just want to welcome everyone and thank you for attending the Small Business and Economic Development Summit today. And we'd like to recognize our panelists. Um, for the 2020 Olympic Games bid, we have Robert Sweeney of the Olympic Committee. For our economic development, we have Keith Sellers of the Washington Economic Partnership. For movie and family entertainment industry, we have Ron Dixon from Studio 202, Nick Schmals, producer and director from the Motion Picture Association of America, we have Van Stevenson, and from Shadowstone Lighting, we have Frank Marsico. We also have Ski Johnson, a Grammy Award winning musician and jazz superstar. <laughs> For the CBE and federal contracting opportunities, we have Angela Franco, CEO and President of the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Malcolm Beach, President of the National Business League of Greater Washington. And George Carlisle from Small Business Administration. And now we'll bring up Councilman Orange, Chair of the Committee on Business, Consumer, and Regulatory Affairs. Okay, let's give my director of business outreach a great round of applause. Ms. Webster's done a great job pulling this all together, as well as uh, my staff. Hopefully everyone is having a good time. I think the, the workshops this morning were, were, were fantastic, and uh, we still have uh, more to come. Uh, I want to thank all those that participated in, in the uh, session this morning. Uh, once again, Angela Franco, President and CEO of Greater Washington Chamber of Commerce. Harry Wingo, President and CEO of DC Chamber of Commerce. Dr. Malcolm Beach, the President of the National Business League of Washington. Rob Summers, who uh, was here this morning, he was Director of DSLBD. Now he's over at the White House uh, having a good time. And uh, the Chairman of the Council, uh, Phil Mendelson, who, who was here earlier as, as well. And uh, as once again, I say it was, it was a fantastic uh, time. But now I would like to introduce uh, my co-host, and at the time when she was co-host, she was only the uh, chair of the Committee on Economic Development and the council member from Ward 4, and I'm glad to ha have a great co-host like this, and now she's the mayor-elect, and so that's even uh, more wonderful. But I can tell you that uh, she certainly brings a, a, a spirit of fresh air, a new start, a new beginning, and she even uh, kind of every now and then uses my line, we're not going to leave anyone behind, we're not going to take anyone for granted, we're just going to move forward and take this to higher heights, and she has a great vision, uh, 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 fifth generation, and her, her dad, uh, uh, Joe Bowser, and her mom, Joan, Joan Bowser, they're, they're great people uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with in, in Ward 5. And I've had the opportunity to sit next to the mayor-elect for the last two years on, on, on the council. And uh, as I'm just saying it's great that, that she's here. And without further ado, we want to bring up the mayor-elect, Muriel Bowser. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here. And I'm very pleased that Councilmember Orange asked me to co-host this event with him. And I know this is an event that he's done before. But more than that, this is a cause that he is committed to. I'm really making sure that this District of Columbia that spends $12 billion each and every year providing services, building buildings, improving roads and infrastructure, um, that the people of the District of Columbia have the opportunity opportunity to have a fair shot um, at participating in um, the, the real prosperity that we've been able to achieve here in the District of Columbia. And what I've learned from watching Vincent, because Vincent um, is my parent, was my parents council member for many years. Um, I grew up and was born and raised in Ward 5, and they happen to uh, adore him. I think he knows that. And in fact, when, when Vincent and I were competitors, I had to remind my father that he was going in to vote for Muriel Bowser. <laughs> Uh, at this time, he couldn't vote for, for Vincent Orange. Um, but I think uh, what uh, our, our friendship uh, demonstrates is that uh, I have the opportunity to lead the District of Columbia as the seventh mayor, um, but I won't be able to do it without strong partnerships um, at the council. And it has been uh, kind of the hallmark of our transition to this point, a 54-day transition, the shortest in the history of the District of Columbia, um, to reach and make sure that I'm having um, 
very frequent conversations with um, the members of the council. I've asked Vince if I can have a regular meeting with him. I think on a lot of issues, uh, we have been uh, like-minded and uh, we can be partners in driving that agenda for the District of Columbia. Um, before I was on the council, I would watch the hearings where Vince would you know, haul in every agency director and ask them why they weren't spending money with small businesses. You I think you remember that, don't you? Give them a round of applause for that. So now I'm going to be the boss of those agency directors, and I don't want them getting hauled in in front of Vincent Orange and not having a good, a good answer. And some of you have been uh, around with me for the last 20 months as we've gone across the District of Columbia um, talking about um, small business opportunities and what it means. And some of you have heard some mayors and directors talk the same old talk, haven't you? Um, and you've told me you don't want to hear that talk anymore. You want to see some action. Um, and so I'm committed to this principle, and, and Vince is right, that I say that uh, in a city that is so prosperous, uh, we shouldn't have double-digit unemployment in parts of our city, right? In a city that's so prosperous, we shouldn't uh, hear that people can't find affordable housing. Um, but we know that you can't afford housing if you don't have a job. And we know if you're a small company, you can't hire my residents if you aren't getting work. And so this is uh, what has to be our, our focus. So how do we take what is what everybody will agree is a great goal and actually um, make it happen? Um, and so my commitment, first of all, is to make sure we're hiring the people that share my vision and Vince Orange's vision, and that's important. Uh, and then we have to we have to hold them accountable. So in our in our, it's a couple of things we, we have to do. We have to make sure the small and local business office that their mission is actually helping small and local businesses. And I, I don't think that the certification function uh, is enough. Um, it has to be a mission of really uh, helping to build capacity and helping to match qualified businesses with opportunity, not only in DC government, but in all of the, with the private businesses that work with us. Um, so as I look to, to remake this government and find leaders, when I talk about small and local business opportunities, um, that's important to me. Um, it's also important that we remain competitive in the city and uh, at, at the DEMPED level, making sure that we are having a, a shop that's focused on attracting new business and supporting existing business, um, and that's hugely important. How our small businesses have access to capital and how the government can get involved um, with helping businesses that are starting out with bonding is also um, very important. Uh, but one of the things that I, that I hear the most, and I think we have the opportunity to affect um, really quickly, is making sure that uh, the the way that we put out our work is not all in big buckets of a hundred million dollars because if we only put out work in big buckets of a hundred million dollars only the big guys can get the hundred million dollars um, and this is why and there's some reasons to do that right it's, it's easier for the government to kind of shift that uh, management of those projects and the risk to somebody else. I get that part. Um, but I, I'm not a bottom line business. I'm a government and I have some other goals. And part of my goals are making sure we're building capacity in our businesses, we're hiring DC workers, and we're keeping the wealth circulating in our cities. Does that sound good, Orange? I think that sounds good. Um, but what that means is we have to think about whether it's a school or a park or a road, um, if we can separate the work. So there's the $100 million work, and that $100 million guy or gal shouldn't be competing for my 50 million or my $10 million project. Um, and I think that there are ways um, that we can make sure that happens. So the last thing I'll say about this, and I think you all know, um, I wanna work with qualified businesses. If you're not, goodbye. <laughs> if you wanna game the system, see you later. Um, and we have to make sure because I, and it's okay for me, it's okay for Orange to preference our local businesses, but it's not okay for anybody, big, little, in the middle, to game our system. Um, and so I can make the argument to preference DC businesses all day long, as long as it's fair, open, and transparent process. And that is what I aim to do. That is what I aim to do. 
So I'm going to ask you to work with me because now we're at the stage uh, in the process uh, where we're going to hire great people. We're going to look at changing all of these things. And there are things, a lot of things that the, the mayor can do alone, um, but there are a lot more things that we can do in partnership with the council and in partnership uh, with, our, with our business community. And I look forward to working with you each and every day on those things. A quick recap, if I might, uh, Council Member Orange, just to let you all know that we've been very busy with transition and a number of our transition leaders are here. Raise your hand if you're participating in a Bowser Transition Committee. I see Ms. Frank. The number of you are on our committees. A number of you have been working really hard on the inaugural activities as well, which we announced today. Um, and I want to see you all at the first event. So don't hesitate to raise your hand. The first event is on New Year's Day at 9 a.m. and it's the Fresh Start 5K. Who's with me? I see you, Maria. Raise your hand. Fresh Start 5K. We're going to focus on wellness, right, and getting a good start to the year. The second event is our interfaith service. It's going to be at 10th and Dream North uh, West on January 2nd at 8 a.m. It will only last an hour because at 9.30, um, I will join the members of the council, um, the chairman of the council, the first elected AG um, for the swearing in a ceremony while I'll raise my right hand and make um, promises to, to lead with integrity um, and energy the District of Columbia. Um, that night, we will have our inaugural ball is at the convention center. It starts at seven. Um, and the following day, we've added an another event to the series of activities, and that is a uh, kids' party. Um, so it's for families in the District of Columbia, and it will be at the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center. So we'll start in Ward 3, we'll finish in Ward 8, and we'll have fun in all eight wards in between. Um, so I hope that you'll join me. Information will go up on my website at murielbowser.com, and the registration and ticket information um, becomes available Saturday, tomorrow, where you can sign up um, and download a ticket like you do when you go to a baseball game. Um, so, uh, Mr. Orange, I know we're going to be friends and partners um, forever, um, and we're going to be friends and partners in, in this next four years for the city that we love. I look forward to working with you all. God bless you. All right, so now you all, you all know my secret as to why I've been working and getting in shape and shedding all these pounds. I've been getting ready for this 5K in anticipation that's going to take place on January 1. Can't have the mayor-elect have me out there huffing and puffing while she's doing her thing. But uh, to the business community, see, I told you, I told you that Muriel Bowser is going to step up to the plate and that she's with us. And, and, but she still uses the same word that I use, you got to have quality. You have to be able to do the work. If you can step up to the plate and you can get the job done in a very efficient and effective manner, and uh, you can uh, you know, do it with integrity and with transparency, and then we're just, we'll be all happy. We'll be one big happy family, and all our boats can, can rise uh, together. And you know, I told you before, as it relates to me, I believe in trapping the dollars at the border. All the dollars should circulate in the District of Columbia. I'd rather, if you're a D.C.-based business and you're subject to D.C. taxation, I'd rather see you get the, uh, the, the contract because in the back of my mind, I know that at least 10% is probably going to come back to D.C. Treasury. And then if all of y'all are D.C. residents and you're D.C. employed, we're going to get some employment taxes back as well, and then we can circulate those dollars so everybody can, can, can prosper. So uh, I, I really uh, look forward to this new beginning and this new start on January 1. And I also want to, want to thank the, the mayor-elect for a couple things. One, in supporting our new legislation that we worked really hard with the Fort Myer Business Roundtable uh, to get that achieved. Uh, there will no longer be just a two-year period of, of, of certification. Once you get certified now, it will be for three years. And if there's no material change in your business, you can recertify. As long as you can get that clean hands document from uh, OTR that you that you paid all your taxes and also you in compliance with uh, uh, DCRA, you're good to go for an, an, another three years. In addition to that, all the agency heads will have to now come up with a plan at the beginning of the year that indicates how they will meet their goal of spending 50% of their expendable budget with the small business enterprise community. And if they can't, they have to go to the boss, and the boss is Muriel Bowser. They got to go to the boss and ask the boss for a waiver and tell her why they cannot meet the law. 
And so that's a great thing. And they also have to execute a document in the beginning of the year saying, this is my expendable budget. It can't be like in this fiscal year where we start off saying their expendable budget is $1.5 billion. Divide that by two, $775 million was supposed to be spent with the small business community. And here we are just yesterday, they're now saying, well, it's only going to be $228 million. Well, the door on fiscal year 2014 is closed. And you're just now telling us that $228 million. So we're going to straighten all that out, but we all have to work together and we all ha have to uh, do our job. So um, Madam Mayor, we want to thank you for being out front and supporting that. And then to the movie industry, I always just want to keep telling you that um, Muriel Bowser, as chair of the Economic Development Committee, reprogrammed dollars from her fund and sent $500,000 to the film incentive fund. So her commitment is there. We're going to grow that industry as well because we're going to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to prosper, as she say, in her city. Born and raised, fifth generation, and she's here. She gets it, but you have to get it as well. Quality, efficiency, and being effective. So thank you very much, Mary. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> In this town, we have learned that no one of us is as good as we are together. In this town, where I work, we have our spats and quarrels. We have our spats and quarrels. But we find unity when it really matters. This town is a little bit misunderstood. But look a little deeper, and you'll find a town rich with the V of life and community. In this town, in this town, in this town. And what we like, we like a lot. And we like our sports. And, and we, we like, like our sports. sports. And the spirit of those who compete. In the water. On the field. And on the courts. We are a sports town. And an arts town. And a food town, too. As many as the neighborhoods and cultures where you'll find us. Bound by a simple, unifying truth. What stops others makes us stronger. Look around. Look around. Look around. And you'll see that we're strengthened by our differences. We come together at times of pride and honor and pageant. And we celebrate achievement. And we celebrate achievement. It is in our DNA to roll up our sleeves and work with people. Down the block or across the aisle to get things done. We shake hands and keep promises. And with so much to describe us, you surely cannot know us by our reputation alone. So know this. When we want something, we go for it. We go for it. Together. 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 Together as Americans. And we want this. So here's our commitment. To put every ounce of our effort and sweat. And ingenuity and support into these games. And we will all be made better because of them. So count us in. I'm in. And I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. We're all in. To foster unity. Not just as a town but as a group of citizens, a nation united, united in the belief that we can achieve greatness. Together. Together. In this country. In this town. In my town. Beautiful. Beautiful. Competitive. Remarkable. Cool. Washington. Washington. Where I live. In Washington. 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 Well, I can definitely tell you that I'm all in. How about you? Are you all in? Are you all in? And, and that's great. And we're looking forward to the, uh, the 2024 Olympic team making their bid uh, next week, the, the official uh, presentation on, on December 16th. And uh, so we're really look, looking forward to that. And I think the, the, the video you just saw really speaks high volumes about all of us coming together and being in. You know, after uh, Muriel Bowser uh, became the mayor-elect, I believe it was on November 4th, Tuesday, November 4th, I put a little bug in her ear and I said, uh, uh, Muriel, I'm going to disappear for about 10 days, uh, but congratulations and, 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 and enjoy yourself. And I snuck off to uh, London and I went over to London to actually uh, do two things. One is to attend the British Business Improvement District's uh, conference and also to spend a couple of days with the London Olympics team and uh, traveling and looking at the uh, Queen Olympic Park and just really seeing what were the do's and don'ts or the pros and cons of, of the process as we uh, continue to move forward for, for our bid. And a person that helped uh, set this up for me is our keynote speaker here today, uh, Andrew Altman. He made sure that the, the team there 
uh, met me and gave me a great tour. And I actually had uh, uh, breakfast uh, with the new person that has taken over his job is now the CEO there. I'm talking about Andrew Altman, who was the CEO of the Olympic Park Legacy Company. He was responsible for the master development of the 600-acre Olympic Park in London. And today, he's here with us to discuss business opportunities, economic development, tourism, and enhanced branding of the District of Columbia through this Olympic process. Uh, but he's no stranger to us, uh, because when Mayor uh, Anthony Williams came into office in 1999, Andrew Altman was there with them as well. So I had the opportunity to work with him for a good six years. He was the planner for the city, did an excellent job. I believe he also was in economic development in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, is just a, a, a great guy. And uh, we actually had uh, lunch uh, last week at the Occidental restaurant. And uh, he's back in town. To, uh, and I know he will do everything in his power to help us win this bid as well. But if you really want to know about something, you have to go out and, and investigate. And I can tell you what London did and how they remade themselves right before the world. The queen jumping out of the plane and, and then, you know, the, 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 the Prince William and Kate and all that good stuff. And just knowing the things that behind the scenes, some of the stories were great. Um, and uh, just pulling it all together. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up our keynote speaker, Mr. Andrew Altman. And Mr. Altman, I just want to say to you, welcome home. Thank you so, so much, uh, Councilmember Orange Vince, for, for having me. And, uh, and it's a thrill to, um, to, uh, to be here today and also to uh, be able to see the mayor-elect after a long time. Congratulations to you. I think it's just it's fantastic for the district. It's so exciting to come back at this moment. Um, it's great. So I, um, I've been living in London for the last five years, and I was, had quietly moved back uh, in August and was taking a very, very low profile um, and just kind of getting my bearings, getting the family reacclimated, and uh, leave it to Vince Orange to find me in my sort of quiet to get a text message. Hey, Andy, it's Vince. What are you doing? I'm thinking, what? How, is this, how does anyone know I'm here? He said, uh, why don't we have lunch? I have an idea. Uh, would you mind speaking? So this is really... Thank you, Vince, because this is my first public speaking in Washington, D.C. Um, since I've been back, and it's truthfully a thrill to, to be back. So um, um, I really love this city, and uh, when we found we were thinking about where to come back to in the United States, um, um, we, uh, we thought long and hard about it and, um, and you know, came right back, uh, right back home, even though I'm a Philadelphian. I consider this home. I spent seven years here and, and loved it. So, um, what I'm there's a, there's a, what I'm going to talk about because there's been a lot of talk about the London story, and I thought it would be important to show you the London story a little bit, not a lot of detail, but just what London did um, because I think it is an inspiration uh, for the Olympics, for legacy, for what an Olympics can do for a city, and even I mean I think and hope we will win, but what what it can do in terms of the whole Olympic bid and the momentum it builds and the support it builds and the vision that you have is a lasting, lasting legacy in and of itself. But it is a truly transformative thing for all those who have, I see not in Washington, but there are lots of skeptics about Olympics in the world. Once they go to London, I think Councilmember Orange, as you'll attest, once they go and they set foot on it, those questions um, really go away about what an Olympics done right can do for your city if you have the right vision and the right leadership, which clearly, um, clearly Washington has. Um, the little secret I'll tell you that's, that people don't know is that London, as much as we are talking about how London is inspiring our bid, London's Olympic legacy was inspired by Washington. Um, and, uh, and I say that because when I was recruited to go over there five, uh, you know, back in 19, uh, 2008 um, and interviewed there, and I got this call, and I thought, why would they ever hire an American to come over to be involved in the London legacy? You know, they're, you know, nine billion pound, you know, 14, million, 14 billion dollar investment you're going to entrust with, you know, to some American. I mean, this makes you know, just made no sense. But I convinced myself and my wife that, well, at least we get a great weekend in London, so what's the downside? So we went, packed up, took the kids, and, you know, for one interview, I got a few days in London. Didn't seem so bad. So I did the interview. Um, at the time I was in Philadelphia, I was the deputy mayor for planning and economic development in Philly. 
um, and you know, was enjoying that and, um, and trying to contribute to that city, really so much of what I had learned here, which again, Philadelphia had been inspired by Washington. And they loved the story of what Washington had done with the Anacostia waterfront, with the revitalization of the city. And they kind of looked at that and said, that is really, truly inspiring. We want to leave a legacy that can do a lot of what you were trying to do in Washington, even though it was early years of what we were doing, they could still see the benefit and it had a great reputation. So one, London was inspired by Washington and now it's great that the bid in a sense really is, um, is really about the continuation of Washington's um, vision. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, about this. So this was uh, when London won the games. London um, did not expect to win the games. Um, they thought Paris was going to win. So they put in a bid, um, and at the time, Tony Blair was the prime minister, um, basically thinking they were gonna lose, but why not, you know? And because at the same time, it was the war with Iraq, and they think they need something to feel good, but then they won. So people were absolutely um, excited uh, about this. And what's interesting, just to give you some context about where is the Olympic Park, and this is where we'll, you'll, as I tell this story, I'm actually, the great thing about coming back is I'm going to, at the end, talk about the parallels with Washington. But I think you'll see in the story a lot of the same themes. The Olympics was basically an excuse to do a major regeneration project in the poorest part of London. And not only the poorest part of London, the poorest neighborhoods in all the United Kingdom. And for years and years have been looking for a way to get investment in those neighborhoods through a big infrastructure project in East London. And it was here. Oh, that works. Great. So this is the river, the Thames River. And as you're moving from west to east, and the Olympic Park was here, and this is where the highest concentration of poverty in the city, and this is where the growth of the city was moving in this direction. And that's what it was all about. The whole program was that basic idea. And it was about what is London's future and it was about looking east. And a lot of this came from, you know, a lot of what you're going to see were the ideas when we used to talk a lot back in Mayor Williams has continued over many, many years about how Washington and the growth in east and east of the river and Anacostia and how one bridges, you know, uses sort of big projects to help to, to regenerate areas. And so for them it was looking east, it was the old Docklands of the city, it had started literally 30 some years ago under Thatcher, and it has been a continuous movement of London East, of which the Olympics was the culmination. This is Canary Wharf, the major financial district that rose on many of those Docklands. So from the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. And what's important is that continuation of a vision for their city, that they wanted to move East and continue to see London grow in that direction. In 2000, there's Canary Wharf, the Millennium Dome was the next big project to move east in the industrial lands. And the interesting, interesting point, and I feel like it's so interesting to make this presentation here because we're, you know, a little deja vu of the years of making presentations about the Anacostia waterfront and the initiative, was how close the Olympic Park was to the core of the city. And yet, if you ask people in London before the Olympics, where is Stratford, which is the name of this area of London? People did not know. People, this, this might as well have been the furthest reach of the city. People thought this was way out because it was seen as an, a no-go. People didn't want to go to this area. Um, yet it was only 15 minutes from the center of London, 10 minutes from that major financial district. But here it was the old industrial lands of the city, surrounded by some very poor neighborhoods, but also very vibrant neighborhoods, neighborhoods with great thriving immigrant communities, um, great community development organizations, great small businesses that all wanted to see opportunity and take advantage of the trajectory of how London was growing. And that was the challenge, how to balance growth and equity, how to build local regeneration and not just have another mega project. It was never about just that. And so that was really interesting. And this was the striking statistic that it was trying to get at. So as much as what underlies a lot of what you saw in the celebration of you know, t four weeks of sport, um, which was great for lots of reasons, for national pride, for sport, everything else, but fundamentally was this which is that as you move from central London to east London, every tube stop, the life expectancy was reduced by a year. So this is a very striking thing about the inequality. So that same area, the Olympic Park in London, 
That red are the areas of the greatest poverty and greatest distress. And that's really what it was about. And this was the aspiration of the mayor of London and what they call the host boroughs. London has boroughs, which are small cities, 32 of them. This was the real goal of how to use the games to have the same, get the same social and economic chances as neighbors across London. They called this um, an agenda convergence, that they wanted people in these neighborhoods to have the same life opportunities, life expectancy, health, all those kinds of indices of, you know, of a healthy community and healthy people to be able to come from the Olympics. So when London won the Olympics, the interesting thing, and if you know the British press, which I thought the US press having been in Washington and then been in Philadelphia, you know, it was fairly tough when you're a public official doing these kinds of things, always, you know, getting hammered. The British really outdo us tremendously when it comes to the press on this. I mean, they want to talk about cynical, tough, you know, press. So the B BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, they, you know, they win the Olympics, and, and the British have a great character, you know, you have to love them because they have this incredibly self-deprecating, you know, we can never pull this off. It's not possible that we could do this. So they win the Olympics. Everyone, as you saw on that first slide, excited, jubilant, we've won, this is amazing. And the BBC goes right to it, you know. The next day, they're out on the site and say, isn't this great, we've won the Olympics? How fantastic. Hey, let's go see the Olympic Park. Oh, well, there it is. And all over the screen, they're going, oh my God, you've got to be kidding. How many years do we have? Seven. I mean, this literally is, so there you have, the you know, Canary Wharf, the financial district, the first big move to East London, tremendous success. And they're saying to themselves, this is interesting. Uh, Prime Minister, how's this exactly going to happen? And you could just imagine, right? 600 acres of this. And this actually, what you're seeing a lot of here was actually debris from World War II because most of the bombing had happened in these areas and they just piled it up here. My first meeting when I went over there and they gave me a budget had a line item for unexploded arsenal I had no idea what that was. I said, what is unexploded arsenal? I said, oh yeah, that, there's some bombs we're gonna have to clean up. I said, oh, well that's, that's excellent. Um, I don't think I'll be doing the field inspection myself, but I uh, certainly will authorize that. Anyway, so this is what they saw. Lots of decayed infrastructure, you know, obsolete from Victorian times. Um, you know, this was the river, the Lee River that went through the Olympic Park that was gonna be our grand vision, great master plan. We're gonna build the largest park in Europe and they went out and said, let's go look at the river. There you go, there it was. A lot of social housing and housing projects. There wasn't much displacement at all because there wasn't residential on the park, but the challenge of how do residents in these neighborhoods, this is generational, years and years of living in these big housing projects in London, which are really, you know, just really drab, really, really tough. Um, how will they benefit and be a part of this? Um, but lots of great communities around. As I said, a lot of vibrancy, a lot of immigrant communities, a lot of folks who've been in these communities for a long time who wanted to see benefits. So quickly, this is just, again, just to give you a feel for the story, because it's, I think it really is exciting and inspirational what, what these Olympics can do is 2005 had to clear all of those 600 acres, um, you know, and, and start the, the process um, to, of building. Um, 2009, as you can see, the site's all cleared, um, 600 acres. It was a lot of, it wasn't as if there was a lot of displacement. All the businesses or a lot of smaller kind of chop shops and different things were all relocated. Um, there were 200 different sort of ownerships here were all put together um, by the government. Um, and then the building started in 2012. Um, here's that Olympic Park. There's that river you saw. And the basic idea was very, very simple, which was to create a new center for the city in East London that was gonna to contribute to the regeneration of these communities, to the poorest communities, to participate economically, and to leave a legacy that would be about the, 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 the redevelopment and regeneration in London um, that would be there for generations. And that was their real vision. So what that meant physically, which was very interesting, is that when you had venues, they weren't just put in one place with a parking lot, they were integrated to build a piece of city, the sports stadium here, a velodrome here, a broadcast center here, and the neighborhoods over time would build around in these spaces and literally bring East London into the park, integrate the site into a park, not have it be a standalone monument to you know, the London Olympics from 2012, but actually be a piece of city that just becomes a central, central part of the city with the main park being the organizing principle and transportation. Now I'll tell you one very funny story as an American, which you'll appreciate very quickly. Um, so 
the first principle was don't keep any, if we don't have to build a permanent venue, we're not going to do it. We'll make them interim venues and, you know, not waste the money on them. So the first venue, when I looked at the plans of what the, um, of what were coming forward with the different venues, this was the basketball venue. And it was on the interim list. I mean, I was there for about a week. And I said, how could basketball, what does that mean? Basketball, an interim venue? I said, no, we have to make that a permanent venue. I mean, it's basketball after all, you know? I grew up playing basketball, not very well, but you know, I love the game, followed it, was a fan. I said, no, we've got to change that. We have to critical, we have to look at this right away. There's obviously a mistake. And they pulled me over and they said, you don't understand the British. The British only compete in sports where they're sitting down. You know, we do horses, we do bike riding, we don't do basketball, okay? That's out, that's an interim venue, you know? And I thought right then, they thought, did we hire the right guy? I mean, maybe we made a mistake. We got this guy from Philly who was in Washington talking about basketball, this is a disaster. Okay, so I sort of lost that one pretty quickly, but you know, I got the point. And the point really was that if you didn't, that these interim venues like this got cleared after the games to become neighborhoods, places for neighborhoods to develop, so that ultimately this would be 10,000 units of housing, 4,000 jobs um, for the community over time, um, and would become a part of the city. And the vision was that by 2025, as you can see, neighborhoods are filling in along here. This will become an employment center for innovation and for jobs, particularly for the communities that are here. The river would be at the center. And it becomes, as you can see, a part of the city, a second center from Canary Wharf to the Olympic Park. And Vince, you saw all this, so I'm not lying. You can testify I'm not just making this up. And they did that very simply. I'm not going to bore anyone with plans. But this was really important, that they actually started with the legacy plan of what they wanted in 2030 and worked back to the Olympics of 2012, right? Lots of games, and the great thing of what's happening here in Washington is, is thinking exactly the same way. The mistake of Olympic cities and where they waste money and squander it is they all, they're so obsessed with the games and they can't think about what happens afterwards, they wait. Cindy waited, they did their games, they didn't wait. Nine years later they said, what do we do about the legacy? They didn't even have a master plan, it took them forever. You're doing, you're, this is the London lesson, which is exactly what Washington's doing, which is you think about what is it you want to leave? What's the legacy, physical, economic, social legacy you want for your city? And what's the image that you want to project to the world and not wait until afterward? And that was the big thing that London did. The second thing they did was, and you know, British are great at these kind of expressions, um, is 75p of every pound, they would say. But it was right, which was that they looked at all the money they were going to spend six billion pounds on the Olympic Park, nine billion pounds in total, but for the Olympic Park of the 600 acres. And they said, how do we make sure that everything as much as possible we spend will leave, right, be able to be, re, will be used for legacy and not just be thrown away for the four weeks. So they said, they came up with, and this became the standard, 75p of every pound. So everything you looked at, if it was infrastructure, is that going to be a platform for future growth? If I'm investing in a, a, a venue, will it have a permanent use? If I have a broadcast and media center of a million square feet, is that going to be built in a way that could be a great place for industry, for motion picture, for studios, for innovation? How do we do that? And they set a bar. So it wasn't about we're going to do big architecture and we're going to spend, if you look at Beijing, you know, Beijing was, had a different idea. It was about national pride. It was about they wanted big architecture. They spent a lot of money on that. London did something different. They spent a lot of money on laying the foundation, creating the platform for future growth and opportunity, and making sure that the money that was spent, the public money, would go toward that. And that became the standard. And that meant things like infrastructure and transportation. Um, there was a whole overground line. Here's East London. That's the Olympic Park in the background investing in basic transportation improvements like you would do with metro improvements. Um, making sure that things like the Olympic Athletes Village here, which was to house 17,000 athletes during games, would be a source of housing after the games. And the deal that was cut was that half of this housing would be for affordable housing because the neighborhoods needed that. And would be family housing because there was a shortage of housing with three plus bedrooms for people in this community. And so half of this housing was sold to a nonprofit organization that would run, that would manage um, what will be 1,500 units of housing, and the other 1,500 units were sold for private market development, um, which basically helped to subsidize to make all of that happen and create a whole new neighborhood with a school, 
with a new health facility. It's going to be a premier charter school um, uh, that's going to be focused on um, not, you would think, sport, but actually on literature and the arts and drama as well as sport. And it's a whole, new, a whole community that came out of this right from the gate. So as soon as the legacy, the games were over, work began on this community and transforming this to be um, a new neighborhood. And the nonprofit moved in, they started interviewing people, they started making the accommodation, retrofitting it, so that this could be a whole new community. And this is what it is today. And people live here, you can't tell, the units are intermixed. Which is an affordable unit, which is a market rate unit. It's truly a mixed income community. And there it is, with a brand new playground to serve the community, housing um, all through here, um, and 3,000 units. The Broadcast and Media Center, a million square feet, my biggest, ag everyone focused on the stadium. What's gonna happen with the Olympic Stadium, the Olympic Stadium? That was in sense really uh, politically a very big and visible project, um, but it had two, two options. It was gonna be a soccer team or it was gonna be athletics. The Broadcast and Media Center, what did we make of it? It's a big box. But the communities over here in East London, the ones I showed you where there's Ha social, you know, housing projects and um, that have been there from the 60s and 70s and 80s, these folks were saying, how is this going to do anything for me? How is small businesses, is this going to do anything for us? We're right over here. So that's great, whatever happens with a sports venue and the park is nice, but what about economic opportunity for us? It's 16.5 billion pounds into the GDP of the UK. How is that going to benefit us? And so this broadcast and media center became a very big issue because that could have been the greatest white elephant, and truthfully, my greatest anxiety every day was how do we do that? And it became, there was a real cry to, let's do something non-traditional. How can this actually help to diversify our economy? You know, we want to move to more innovation. It, let's not just make it a shed. You know, it could be a warehouse. That's not going to do much for anyone. So we went out and actually created, um, spent a lot of time, got BT Sport to do studios, um, and actually to transform a structure that was seven um, aircraft carriers long, right, and a big massive shed to accommodate studios, to have a university move in, Loughborough, which is a premier institution in the UK for sport, to do sport research, because they saw the relationship of using the park and healthy living and the kinds of things that were happening in that community in terms of obesity, in terms of life expectancy, in terms of um, youth health issues, um, and using that to do sport research in that community. And also the uh, local community college took space for training. There's a startup incubator space. And so we're able to leverage, I guess this is the point, and this is of course the vision for what is happening in Washington, leverage the opportunity of the Olympics to bring something really special to this community that wouldn't have otherwise happened, but the cachet of the Olympics, the economic pull of the Olympics, of creating something out of that shed. Another thing that happened, and I'm just gonna be a couple more minutes, because I know uh, you got the session this afternoon, is um, a mall came in. Now you might say, okay, it's a mall, you know, but it was the largest mall in Europe, Arbus Urban Mall. Uh, Vince, you saw this. Um, it came in because of the investment in infrastructure um, into this area. Um, and the interesting part about this is that on the job connection, they were gonna have 10,000 jobs at this mall. It's a Westfield Mall. Australians came in, saw what was going to, the vision for what was gonna happen at the Olympic Park, and had to make a decision. Do you want in or out? If you want in, you have a one-time opportunity, we went to them, because we're going to, we can put 250 million pounds into infrastructure to connect you to the transport system of London, but you have to decide, and this is 2008. 2009, the market had crashed. So they had to decide, do they want to go in all equity and take the risk or miss out on the opportunity to be connected you know, to this part of London and a million and a half people who live around there? They took the risk to their credit. They're Australians. Australians are great at taking risk. Um, and they said, let's do it, you know, gung-ho. Um, and the best thing is was the commitment they made, which is that of the 10,000 jobs, 35% of those, over 3,000 jobs, um, were for people from that community um, who previously were unemployed. And, and we created a retail academy training people for those jobs in advance so that they could go and, you know, not only just entry-level jobs, but get them on a track for entry-level to management level to really have careers 
and really have opportunity there and work with them on a program that not only got them into the first job, but actually stayed with them so there'd be you know, a real ladder of opportunity. And they've done that, and they have really kept to that promise. And it's very, it's a great, it's really wonderful that there are like 3,000 people from that, those neighborhoods that I showed you who are now working at that mall. The opening happened, um, reopening of the park. Uh, 2012 were the games, 2014 it reopened. It took two years to reopen the park. That's the mayor of London, Boris Johnson, out there at one of the playgrounds. Um, and this is, you know, as you come out of the tube in London, it's London's newest park. And, it's, you know, the, the, the vision, it's one of the largest regeneration projects in the UK and Europe, um, opened up to the excitement of people. And, you know, and the great thing is that this is a park now, the Olympic Park, that's been transformed for the community, for people from the community. This isn't about tourists. This is a, this is a diverse neighborhood. This is predominantly minority neighborhood, um, and, and these are folks who are using this park. It's not a tourist park. This wasn't a park that was just going to be a spectator park. The success was this, was this going to be about the community at the end. And this is just a day before I left London. I went out, just by, you know, just wanted to wander around and say goodbye, uh, you know, not to anyone there, particularly they don't know me, but you know, just say goodbye to the park figuratively. I was wandering around with my iPhone, taking photos to say, what is this really like? Because one day I'll probably make a presentation. Vince Orange is probably going to find me one day. And I don't know what I'm going to say. And I'm going to have some evidence that I'm just not you know, um, lying about this. And it was a great pride to see people using that park. And there's the Olympic Stadium, and there it is um, today. So it was a great honor to do that. Um, in my job, I didn't say, was running as been to the, the Olympic Legacy Company that was set up. This was the great thing London did that you guys will think about. Set up before, three years before the games, to only focus on the master planning and master development of the park. So they had one company that did the games, the organizing committee. They had a lot to do. Said, let's not, they're not, they're not going to be around after the games. Let them do the games and do it well. Let's fix, set up a company just to do legacy, and that's all we worried about. And the great thing about this, I have to say, stepping back, and we can have lots of debate, and people can have lots of things about numbers. Was the economic benefit positive, negative? Lots of reports to show it was positive in London. Um, how many people got jobs? There were, you know, there were, were 40,000 jobs created for the games themselves. 25, 30 percent of those went to local people. Construction academies were set up. Small businesses were able to benefit um, in all kinds of ways, from construction of venues to catering to branding to content. There's in every way of the supply chain, which um, we can go into. But there's been lots of reports of it. But the other great, great intangible thing, because those are very important and very real. 8,000 apprenticeships, for example, was that the brand, what it did for the city, people felt great about it. And people no longer said, where is East London? People knew East London. My, my kids, who we, we lived in um, North London, before the games, I went to his, my son's class, and I said, how many of you know where East London is and where the games are? No one could raise their hand within London. Today, I went back after that, everyone raised their hands. 25 million people went. It changed the perception of this neighborhood. It changed the map of the city and how people think about it. So I want to end, and how am I doing? Am I way over? I, you sure? OK, sorry. I can get excited about this because it's exciting. So this is, that's the Olympic Park. And it's a bigger picture. It was part of the transformation of the city. Why it was successful, they had a vision for the city that the Olympics fit into, not the other way around. It was part of a 30-year history of moving east, and it's going to be part of the next 30 years as the city keeps growing. This is all of East London, the airport, that was the uh, Canary Wharf. It's part of this big picture. Now, I want to just do something really quickly, because I can only do this here, and I've been waiting to do this for now for five, for you know, years, which is why does, how does this relate to Washington anyway? It's because, as I said, the vision when I went over there, my inspiration was Washington, you know? So I'm glad London's taken ownership of Washington's vision. But the truth is, and set a new bar for the Olympics about legacy. I mean, clearly Rio and Tokyo, all these places, the legacy, it's, I, I think, but you would concur, right? London's become the kind of standard bearer of, you know, you guys talk about it a lot, which is great. But truthfully, a lot of this was, you know, went back even before 2000, but the whole idea is about the Anacostia waterfront. I'm not going to do a whole presentation. You're not going to see my 2000 presentation again, those of you who have seen and going, oh, God, he's still going to do the same PowerPoint. No, but, but the idea of, of, of that, very similar to London, right? It was about the city. It was about east of the river. It was about how the Anacostia River could be a source of the future growth and regeneration. It 
we know it's some of the poorest districts in the city that want to benefit from that growth and participate, and it's a huge challenge. It continues to be. This was it when we started the Anacostia Waterfront Initiative with um, Mayor Williams, um, who had great credit for the vision he had, and that's been carried on. Um, that was the southeast waterfront where the yards was not that long ago. And it's amazing to me, amazing to come back, and incredible to see what's happened with the transformation from that to all the development that happened, because back then, which is not that long ago, it seemed as distant as to London, the Olympics seemed to them. And I think, you know, you look down at the images of what's happened at the Anacostia waterfront, you know, we imagine that this is actually real, it's not something that was just in a brochure. Um, back when we had planning documents, we'd have these images of people enjoying the waterfront, and people, you know, there's like watercolors that you produce in every plan, and people thought, oh God, not another watercolor. But here it is when I, you, know, you come back to Washington and pick up the paper, and I was amazed to see what's happening. And then you see what the Olympics is going to be, and could be, to continuing to provide you know, for the Anacostia, for East of the River, for all of Washington, um, opportunities um, as we move forward. So I guess what I you know, want to leave with is that you know, London got an inspiration from Washington, and the, what you're doing with the Olympics, and whether, you know, hope, you know, I hope that um, Washington will win. I think it has an amazing chance to win because it's such a strong city and has such a strong vision and has such strong leadership, and, and the mayor elect coming in with so much energy and vision, um, which is fantastic and gives it a huge boost. Um, it goes back to, you know, the big picture of the vision for the city, the plan for the city, and even if it does, you don't win, which I hope won't be the case, it's, you know, there's still that opportunity of how you use all the momentum you've built to continue what's happened in Washington around the transformation. There's a huge amount of work left to do. I know that. It's far from done. These things take lots and lots of time. They're tough issues to deal with, um, but there's a lot of opportunity. And the Olympics, if we win it, can create huge opportunity. Apprenticeships, small business, the supply chain. I mean, I can tell you the number of businesses you know, um, there, there was, we had small businesses who literally built that um, um, basketball venue you saw was all done by a business um, in, uh, in East London and in Scotland. There's a huge opportunity. I mean, literally about half of the GDP of the London Olympics was built, um, um, was, I'm sorry, benefited from, uh, by small businesses um, and the jobs it created. So it's a great opportunity. I hope um, we win. I think there's a great, great um, excitement and vision to do this. And um, I just want to thank you, Vince, for having me to be able to share the London story, but importantly to also tell you that it's a Washington story and can continue to be Washington's story. And uh, let's do well. Bob, good luck in the next coming weeks. Uh, we'll take maybe two questions, and then we'll uh, move on. Does anyone have any, any questions? Yes. Oh, you mean the selection? Yes, absolutely. So the question was, I think, does your plan for, um, for the Olympic bid, when you're going for the Olympics, of legacy, your master plan, what you want to do in the future, how does that weigh on your... Does that, does that influence, does it matter in how you're selected? I think the question is absolutely, I would say, because, you know, they want to know, first of all, they're very influenced by if you come in with a very strong vision about what you want to do, and that you're going to use this investment to actually further your city. So after London, um, Rio um, is 2016, and Rio built on the London legacy and said, we want to have a strong legacy, we're going to invest $16 million, um, and we're going to leave a legacy for our city, which was um, around transportation and around housing and a number of other things. So it influences them greatly. If they see that cities come in and they don't really have a clear vision of what they're trying to do, um, or they don't believe it's going to actually, that investment's going to leave a legacy, um, they don't look on that in the same way. I think it's changed. Can you do the same thing with the World Cup? Yes. Yeah. Can you do the same thing with the World Cup? Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, that was, that was oh, is that the question? Yeah. Well, what are the benefits of yeah. the difference between the World Cup and the Olympics? Um, well, the World Cup is the FIFA advantage of that big process. The World Cup is not the same really at all. It's countries' bid for the World Cup. And 
cities bid for the Olympics. We need the mic. That's the difference. So if the U.S. is bidding for the World Cup like we did, it would probably be in New York and Washington and Chicago and L.A. And, you know, that's how it would all be laid out. Um, anyway, the Olympics, cities bid. I think one answer to your question, though, is any mega event, you know, whether it's a World Cup, an Olympics, could be something else, right? All those, you know, expo cities, there's lots of these different kinds of things, can all have a great benefit of your city if it's part of what your plan for the city is. Just bringing in a venue and just like, just, you know, building a soccer venue somewhere, let's say, or three soccer venues, doesn't necessarily in and of itself do anything, right? I mean, it might be a great venue, you might need it, you might use it afterward for some sport, but if it's part of what you're doing, if it's part of a comprehensive regeneration, you say, look, this is a part of our development strategy. At the end of the day, these are big pieces of infrastructure. So it's all to me about leverage. How do you leverage them to create opportunities? Last question. Um, so the answer is all of them because there, we didn't have to do any residential displacement for this. So um, there might be people who don't remain because there's gentrification, you know, what's happened with some rising housing values, but nobody was kicked out of the area. And in fact, with the Olympic Park, one of the things we did to make sure uh, in the master plan is that not only was the Olympic Village 50% of that uh, um, housing for affordable housing, but 35% of all the housing that's built within that Olympic Park, so 10,000 units, you know, 3,000 units, all have to be affordable um, so that we create new opportunities for people in the community um, who've been there for a long time and also for a new demand for affordable. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give Andrew another round of applause. <clears throat> And I, I think one of the, one of the, the, the great things about this process, and, and Andrew definitely uh, laid it out, is that London, they looked and started at Legacy 2030, and then they worked back. And I believe that's the same thing that we have to do here. Many of you may, may recall that long before the Olympics really got up and running that I introduced this legislation that indicated that we should start discussions with the White House over taking over uh, RFK footprint uh, that we work, that we are going to build a soccer stadium, and then we'll have a non-producing asset right there at RFK Stadium, and then we also have a DC Armory, and then if you bring Langston Golf Course into the equation, you're talking about 500 acres, and you know with that, uh, you can really have a great vision and a great location to do all the things that London was able to do and really work our legacy and work back to, uh, to 2024. And so I think it's a golden opportunity for us to have you know, the Olympic Stadium, the Olympic Village. Uh, out of this process, if it was up to me, we'd have a, a, a first class 18 hole PGA golf course that with a, a state of the art golf course that's up near the uh, Arboretum and looks back over the golf course into the new stadium into the Olympic Village. We can have our sound stages there where we're uh, producing the movies. Uh, we can also have uh, some luxury hotels where all the visiting teams that come to Washington, D.C., the 80 visiting teams at the 80 times they visit the, the Nationals, when they visit for the hockey team, when they visit to play basketball, they can stay at our hotels there at, at Olympic Park, and then we just keep those dollars in, in the city, have retail, have restaurants, and uh, so it's, it's, it's a great vision. So that's why I'm really there with, with Robert Sweeney, and when I invited him to my office a few months ago, and he came in and laid out that plan, I said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and I said, how come you guys didn't jump on board early? He says, no, we had to be real quiet. We got to be like that quiet storm developing, and, and we have to wait till the right time to put this vision out. But uh, at the end of the day, without vision, the people want to perish. And we don't want to perish. We want to keep on moving forward, taking things to greater heights. But at the end of the day, 
We want those dollars circulating in the District of Columbia because all the things they're talking about, someone is going to have to create it. Someone is going to have to build it. And that's where this community comes in. So I, I, what I would say to you is just roll up your sleeves, get ready. There's a lot coming our way. It should be a lot of opportunity for us to improve the quality of life for the citizens of the District of Columbia. Thank you.